Well, good morning. It's great to be back. Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas. We are in, uh, we are in the book of Proverbs, studying together, chapter 25. And this morning we are beginning in verse 2. And hopefully we finish up at verse 13. We are going to skip a few of these Proverbs because they deal with court settings. And we have covered those Proverbs before, so rather than be redundant over the ethics of a court or a courtroom, we will uh, we'll pass on a few of these Proverbs. So here is our text this morning, uh, chapter 25, beginning in verse 2. And this is where I left off last time in an introduction, I guess, that went a little too long because I ran out of time. The, uh, the glory of God to hide a matter, but the glory of a king to search out a matter. And three, as for the heavens with reference to height, and the earth with reference to depth, and the heart of kings, there is no searching out of them. Four and five, we're going to skip courtroom ethics and verse 6 do not honor yourself before a king and in the place of great people do not stand interesting proverb it's tied to verse 7 better we have a better than proverb here better one say to you come up here than one humiliate you before a noble so 8, 9, and 10, courtroom proverbs. Again, we're going to skip. And now we come to one that you're probably very familiar with. 11, apples of gold in a silver sepulcher are a, you may have word. It's actually words that come to or bring us to a decision. Finally crafted words that bring us to a decision. That's the idea of the proverb. Made appropriate to its providence or to its circumstance. I always like to say providence because everything is providence. We are coming into the fall season and we have gone through a horrific hot summer. And now we're going to see the wind start coming out of the north and the leaves on the trees are going to change and they're ultimately going to fall. And we say, well, it's the fall season. Calvin says, no, it's the natural providence of God. It's predictable, but it's providence. Special providence is where all of the laws that we're accustomed to run contrary. So you have a three inch snow in the Bahamas. That's special providence. That's all providence. And so that it would be circumstance. Twelve, we're going to skip about listening. We've had proverbs on listening and we're going to try to finish up on 13. The coolness of snow in the time of harvest is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. We he refreshes his master. And so that is what we want to be about. Refreshing one another. I'm going to do something that I haven't done ever uh, since being involved in the ministry. And that is uh, the result of reading the history of the Reformation that I did last year, 776 pages, little tiny print, and it took me uh, well over a year. And I was so gripped by Luther and the Diet of Worms and the great drama that that incurred in history. And I've had church history, and I never had it presented to me like the way Davin Ye wrote it. And so 
I am going this morning to begin our study with a little bit of that history for our edification. And I made up my mind from now on, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the end of October and I am going to press Luther and the Reformation forward to people and to people's hearing. Because I think we don't give it enough time and enough attention. That's what I'm going to do for just a few moments by way of introduction. When Martin Luther entered the foyer of the Great Hall at the Diet of Worms, the one man walked in to this Great Hall and here is what was waiting for him. Front and center, the Emperor Charles V. His brother, the Archduke Ferdinand. Six electors of the empire whose descendants all wore the crowns of kings. Twenty-four dukes. Eight margraves. Thirty archbishops. Seven ambassadors. Among them, the kings of France and England. The deputies of ten towns. A great number of princes, counts, sovereign barons, the nuncio, that's the personal ambassador of the Pope himself, the nuncio of the Pope, 204 personages, all of rank in the world of that day. Now, here is the astonishing writing of Abinye for our exhortation. The summons and the appearance of Martin Luther was in itself that day a single victory of history of the Reformation over the papacy. The Pope had condemned the man Yet, here he stood. And before a tribunal much more than a mere pope. The pontiff had put him under a ban, debarring him from all human society. And yet, here he was. Ordered and convened, and so by his appearance, to this august audience, Treated in the most honorable of fashion and terms. The Pope had ordered his mouth shut and forever mute. And yet, here he was. He was going to open that mouth and he was going to open it before an audience of the highest rule in all the world, the civilized world, to be sure. And outside of that audience, thousands upon thousands upon thousands from every corner of Christendom with His appearance alone, the Reformation had now struck a great victory over Rome, and an immense revolution was taking place among the common people of the world. Rome and her power was descending from the throne. All at the bidding and the appearance of one single man, a monk. Now, we're here to study the Proverbs. I want to give you one. 2122. 
A wise man scales the city of the mighty and he pulls down the strongholds in which they trust. That's what the Lord did in and through one single man. One man. A man imbued with convictions of what he believed that God and God alone taught him through the Word. May I give you another? Moses, Exodus 3, before the burning bush, standing there in the midst of sheep on a Midian desert with a staff in his hand. And you recall the story, all kinds of excuses came from Moses. The God of heaven and earth had got the wrong desert and had picked the wrong guy. But see, here's what we learn. It's never an issue of who Moses was. And it's never an issue of who you are or I am. I want you to consider that nothing changed with this man's visage. Nothing. The size of his cranium didn't increase. His brain power, his IQ did not go up. He did not grow two or three inches taller. No, matter of fact, according to Moses' own testimony, his mouth was dull and slow. And God left that mouth just as it was. Dull and slow. Regeneration, the power of the Holy Spirit does not change us in any form or fashion. We remain who we are. But, it's in that very frailty, in that very weakness that we find ourselves that he sets about to do a great thing. The only proposition for you and me is our willingness to be used. D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman. Common shoe salesman. He was saved. And he heard, God has yet to find one man that will be totally committed to Him. And Moody said, I'll be that man. The shoe salesman. I'll be that man. No intellectual giant. We don't have commentaries written by Moody. He was a, a soul winner. An evangelist. But I have stood in Moody's church in downtown Chicago on many occasions. And I have been there and sung the great hymns of the faith. And I have listened to the preaching and exposition of the Word from the Moody church that takes up an entire city block downtown Chicago. What can God do with one person? One individual? What can He do with you? What can He do with me? All He asks is our availability. And He does the work in and through despite all of our weaknesses. That's the glory of God. And that's our subject. This morning, beginning with verse 2. The glory of God. I want you to observe the parallels in this proverb. Line 1, glory of God. Line 2, glory of a king. Line 1, it's to hide. Line 2, it's to search. We open the proverb, the glory. The word is honor. The word means heavy. 
It's used of abundance of riches in Numbers 24.11. And so, here is God. He's heavy. We grew up in the culture, all of us now, the drug culture. The drug culture of the 60s. Hey, man, that's heavy. Uh, meaning profound, meaning ponderous, used to prose, used to poetry, and of course, uh, art and music. Heavy music, man. And so I was thinking, in order to introduce this proverb now for the second time, I would give us something really heavy, man, for our introduction to verse 2. How about the universe? Um, the majority of our lives, we were all taught the same thing. It's collapsing. And in a few billion years, it will all shrink down to such a small size and time will end. It's what we were taught. And then in the spring of 1990, we launched the Hubble telescope. And out to space it went. And we learned something. That we were all wrong. It's not collapsing. Are you kidding me? It's expanding. And it's expanding at a rapid rate. We've got to change our theory. And we did. And we have all listened to it for now the last three decades. The Big Bang. The Big Bang. That's why it's all expanding. It's all going out somewhere. It's taking up larger and larger quantities of room. And now, we have the James Webb. Three stories high, infrared cameras, and launched so as to go beyond the moon so that we have no light hindering our vision whatsoever. Well, what have we learned? What have we seen just since the beginning of these pictures in the summer of 2022? Right now, said Dr. Allison Kirkpatrick of the University of Kansas, I find myself lying awake at 3 a.m. in the morning, staring at the ceiling and wondering if everything I have done is wrong. Done means what she has learned and what she has taught. See, the theory was that galaxies take three billion years. And then we have that black patches of space and the James Webb has taken pictures of what the Hubble showed us to be those black spaces. But they're not black. They are gigantic galaxies far beyond what we had seen through the Hubble. Now, all of our theories of time and space have to be recalibrated and changed. Currently, all the data, because it's so new, has come under peer review. Meaning, everyone is studying through everyone's calculations and assumptions. Brains upon brains upon brains. Peer review. But here's what I found Refreshing. It brought a smile to my face. This astrophysicist said, these pictures are disturbing. I like that. 
Now they're questioning the Big Bang. Now they're questioning black matter. Maybe it's not black out there at all. Maybe there's something out there that we aren't seeing, they're saying. And they're questioning all of time continuum altogether. It's all wrong. Perhaps it's time for everyone to put down their telescopes and stop spending billions and billions of dollars on these telescopes in outer space. Perhaps we should turn to the Word of God, which you have in your hand. And here's what it says. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. He's beyond your figuring out. So our proverb declares, look, he hides, meaning to conceal from sight. It's used 27 times in the Old Testament. And on five occasions, it refers to God Himself hiding His face away from. So He's not going to listen to prayer from His people because of their wickedness. The term matter, the English Standard Version, the King James translates it things. Very familiar Old Testament word applied here to the name of God who caused the creation and so line to the glory of kings. Remember in the book of Proverbs, the kings are always the ideal. There is never a proverb about wickedness from a king. The king is the ideal. He drags a threshing floor over the wicked in his throne. He doesn't allow the wicked into his presence. That's the king always in the Proverbs, the ideal. So the king has an obligation to make sure that his people are protected. That's the ideal. So he has to be well informed as to the affairs. Which brings us back to the diet of worms. You see, in the beginning, all this conclave of royalty coming together, it was nothing more than a pep rally for the Roman church. It was just a big convention. Everybody rubbing shoulders with the high and the mighty. And it was a foregone conclusion that if we bring Luther in here, he won't come out walking. He'll be in a body bag. Then something happened in the providence of God. Duke George of Saxony, who was no fan of Luther, that's important element. He despised him, considered him an enemy. He was a disruptor of his kingdom. He just wanted smooth waters. And Duke George of Saxony, to everyone's astonishment, he got up and he lambasted the Roman church, listing the grievance, grievances and the complaints of the people, how Rome every day invented new demands of debt for the people, creating new ordinances to sell, to farm out ecclesiastical benefits, the growth of indulgence shops springing up everywhere. Why, they're like the little marijuana places that we find in the city. They, they take up all the real estate now. And all for the purpose of draining the pockets of the common citizens, the bishops of Rome and their priests imposing penalties, always in pursuit of money. It's always about the money. And instead of 
giving a righteous format to society. They were people of scandals. That's what they were. The Roman church. Abusing people to the ruin of their own reputations. That's what the duke said. And it's a historic record. So this man, to his credit, look at your proverb. He searched out a matter. He listened to his people. And searching to investigate the affairs of justice and human suffering. The common people among his kingdom. What is the proverb indicating? That God blesses righteous government and He curses wicked government. You look at our America today. The great institutions of our country, the FBI, the Department of Justice, and so forth. They're all, the Senate, the Congress, it's all about the money. No one stands for anything. It's pathetic. And it is a proof that the curse of God is upon us. The church should speak with a loud and clear voice. We're not interested in the politics of the day or the decisions that are made in Washington, but we are going to proclaim righteousness. We are going to proclaim the Word of God. And that's the proverb. Here's three. As for the heavens and the reference to the height. What an incredible proverb. Here, the inscrutability of a king's heart, his thinking, his motives, his emotions, all in comparison to grand matters. What are those grand matters? Well, that would be the seas, the heavens, and the earth. Line one, the heavens is a reference to the visible sphere of skies and the earth above the surface of the earth. The addition to the words, the height, the emphasis that they are above the surface of the earth where man is restricted to stay by providence. Line two, the depth. Speaking of the limitless extent of the earth far below the surface, the sovereign creator has made all three elements. Here they are. The skies above, the depths below, and the king's heart. Now, I don't quibble about your translations. All the translations are good and accurate. But I will make this exception on this proverb because the grammars do and they do very forcefully if you have an and in your proverb then that is a good translation that's your King James I'll explain if you have a so that is a bad translation because that's a summary that's a conclusion and is better because and coordinates the comparison of the creation that cannot be found out with the same, the king whose heart cannot be found out. So, if you have a King James, you have an and, bravo. The, the heart is the center of the person. That's what we've learned in the Proverbs. The Lord knows the heart. John 2.24 the Lord Jesus did not entrust Himself to men because He knew the heart. So here the king's heart. And what are we told? It's inscrutable. Let's contemplate that for a moment. Why would Saul, the first king in Israel, turn on David, his most loyal subject? Why would he do that? Why would Solomon, the son of David, not follow the Proverbs that he wrote? He didn't follow his own counsel to his shame. You see, we've got to be king thinking here. Kings, by their mere voice, control life or death, 
They control economies. They control peace and war. It, there's no one to appeal to. The king has it all. And the proverb says, his decisions are inscrutable. The word is associated with an impossible task. Job 11 and verse 7. You might remember Job 11.7 if you ever listened to S. Lewis Johnson's systematic theology because all through his lectures he would stud this verse. Job chapter 11 and verse 7. Canst thou by searching find out God? And the answer, of course, is no. You can't find out. His the answer is impossible. So what goes into a king's decision, the very same word, is beyond figuring out. This man has absolute power and he wields it. All we know, and we know for sure because we've studied the Proverbs together, is that God rules the king's heart. That's Proverb 21.1. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord and he directs it like a water course. So we skip 4 and 5 and we now move to 6. Do not honor yourself before a king. The proverb consistently teach against self-aggrandizement or boasting in any way. Here, particularly in regards to a throne room and throne room behavior before a king. Six and seven here are tied together, bound by skillful behavior in the presence of royalty. The prohibition, not to honor. Now, we make an exception with this word. It doesn't mean riches, and it doesn't mean heavy. It's actually the word meaning splendor, meaning dignity. So we have the translation of esteeming yourself. Don't do it, says the proverb. And the occasion for not doing it is certainly before royalty and particularly before a king. The place where the smart and the gifted are known to congregate. Notice this word great. That's a word of, grant, of rank and influence. And this final phrase, do not stand. Do not take positions of rank and influence that would entail that you see yourself somehow or another as an equal. Don't do that. And so here's the wisdom. In all of life, stay humble. Give preference to other people as more valuable than yourself. Genesis 41.16 don't turn there, I'm going to read it. But in order for you to understand the significance of Genesis 41:16, I need to paint the picture for you. So here it is. Joseph is about to step through the threshold of the Pharaoh of Egypt. The Pharaoh has had this dream, as we all know the story. Somehow or another, in the providence of God, it has been stapled to the frontal lobe of his brain. He can't get it out of his mind. He sees it, and he can rehearse it for us over and over because he saw it in vivid color in three dimensions. Now, Inner me, little old me. And I saunter up to Joseph and I put my arm around the boy's shoulder and I say to him, Son, I'm going to give you some advice. 
What you know, no one else in heaven or earth knows. You know it all. No one can interpret this dream but you. You walk in there, you throw those shoulders back, you speak authoritatively, you speak loud and clear. You are delivering the Word of God to the Pharaoh. But he doesn't do that. Genesis 41.16 Pharaoh is the only one that speaks. I have heard it said that you can interpret dreams. Every eye now is on Joseph. Every ear is attentive to the words of his lips. Speak it out, young man. Declare it. Look at the suffering that you have been through. This is your break. This is your time. Seize it. Genesis 41, 16. Joseph says, I cannot interpret your dream. But God will give to the Pharaoh the answer he desires. He gave glory to God alone. You know why this guy is so great? You know why this guy has so much power and influence in his life? Because in everything he does, everything he says, he gives glory to God. 1 Samuel 2.30, I will honor those who honor me. What a contrast in this proverb that one would take a position of rank and influence and see himself as an equal. Joseph is our model for living in everything. Here's seven. Better one says to you, come up here, then one humiliates you before a noble. In Luke chapter 14, we can all wait for Mark's exposition when he gets here. One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee. He then carefully noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited you both will have to come and say to you, give this person your seat, and then you'll be humiliated for taking the least important place before an audience. But when you're invited, said the Lord Jesus, take the lowest place so that you're, when your host comes, he will look at you and say to you, come up here before everyone and then you'll be honored in the place of all the other guests at the wedding. And then he explained his parable with this line, for a word of explanation, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Our proverb here presents to us a contrast of two social situations. Line one, to come up, that's the promotion, and line two, to be humiliated. That's the demotion. It's a better than proverb. Directed to a person personally. That's the you in the statement. Now, here's what you find in a throne room. 
I really never thought about it like this. But the king has a unique vantage point in a throne room. He sees all the faces at once. All the people that appear before him are all staring at one face, the face of the king. And so the king, looking at all faces, comes to his own decision. Move up. I give these young men on Friday morning that I have the opportunity to teach men in business in Oklahoma City, I, I give them this word from Peter more often than not. First Peter 5, 5 and 6. Young men, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself Therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That's the providence. The invisible providence. That's why you are where you are today. You are under the mighty hand of an invisible God. And all of your circumstances, providences, are His mighty hand. And now the conclusion, the purpose for living this way, so that He may exalt you in due time. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. It's tied to your future. Don't tell me you're too old. That's Moses out on the wilderness. I'm too old. I don't have the financial strength. Don't tell me that. Could it very well be that God has taken you to this point in your life, given you the meager resources that you have, but you are now a student of His Word, and now, more than ever before in your life, you now see the issues clearly so that He, in His providence, is waiting for a blessing for you right around the corner. Who knows? God knows. We are the sheep of His pasture. We're the flock under His care. He's the one that's leading and guiding. Just don't sell yourself short. Line two, humiliation means to cause you to be low. God has a plan and God has a purpose and it's a good one and it's directed to you just where you are today. Follow His Word. Listen to His voice. Make prayer a priority. Stay on the path and wait for Him. He's got a plan to all of this. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study today. Thank you for the people of Believer's Chapel. And thank you for the elders and the deacons and their families. Thank you for the gifted men that you have raised up generation after generation, decade after decade, that have come from this place to fulfill your purpose that the Word of our God would be proclaimed in the hearts and minds and lives of people just where they are today. So we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would speak and speak loudly and clearly to just exactly where we are today in our weakness, but firmly convinced that our dedication to You will bear great 
an abundant future for the blessing of not only ourselves, but for your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.